Good morning. Glad to have you here with us. Let's stand up. Let's put our voices together. Lift up the name of our God, the Lion and the Lamb. Let's worship Him. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates, so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion. Of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is unstoppable, and He is here with us, and we want to declare that together as we sing these words. Who can stop the Lord all? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. Hi, I am Jennifer Powers, the early childhood minister at Northside Christian Church. As we prepared for this baby dedication, we talked about the value of intentional parenting and how our hopes and dreams are more than just them becoming a basketball player or a firefighter or even the next president. These families before you have prayed. Let me scoot over. We've got a few more coming. Um, these families before you have prayed about the character qualities they want their child to become. Passionate, genuine, brave, godly, humble, kind, 
forgiving, and a faithful servant. It is my pleasure to introduce these families who are ready to make a commitment to raise their child to love and know Jesus. Harper Michelle Edwards and Madison Don Edwards were born to Brandon and Lindsay. Harper and Madison are sisters, they're twins. <laughs> <laughs> Gage Harrison Hammock was born to Drew and Shelby. Gage's older brother is Matt Mason. Samantha Faye Ray Ryan Houston was born to Joseph and Rebecca. Samantha has three older brothers, Jared, Jason, and Jonah. Alex, or excuse me, Elena Reese Kent was born to Alex and Tina. Elena's older brother is Rory. Alexander Jameson O'Neill was adop adopted by Justin and Becky. Alexander's older brother is Carson, and her older sister is Maddie. Jensen Atlas Tyler was born to Michael and Megan. Jensen's older sister is Natalie. Alexandria Marie Valdez was born to Santiago and Julie, and her older brother is Saint. Elizabeth May was born to Kevin and Samantha. Elizabeth's older sister is Hannah, and her two older brothers are Levi and Nathaniel. Thank you so much for being here and doing this, uh, for committing to Christian parenting. And I want you to know you got support. We prayed for you last night in first service. We'll pray for you in third service and all these folks. So it's not only all these folks, but you've got a big church family behind you uh, that's uh, praying for you and here for you to be an example and a model. So we want to give you a charge if we can. Uh, this first goes to the congregation. As I told you, we're here to support you. So congregation with strength and guidance from God, do you commit yourself to instructing these children in God's word, praying for them, modeling Christ's love for them, and assisting these parents in training these children in the way they should go? We do. Thank you. Parents. With strength and guidance from God, do you commit to raise your child to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to love them by discipling, training, and setting a Christ-like example for them? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each life here. Each life a precious gift from you. Each life with a plan and purpose. It's hard to imagine as little as they are. That, Father, you have, a, you have a mission plan for them. And you brought them into our lives to parent them, to teach them, to love them, to guide them, to support them. Father, I pray for your blessing, your guidance, your focus, your single-mindedness for these parents. That they might be your parents, raising these children to be men and women of God. I pray for us as a church body, we'd love and support them, encourage them, and challenge them. Father, and you might help us to be a living, breathing, vibrant, powerful church of family of families. And bless these families, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for sharing your kids with us. <laughs> all right welcome to you it's good to, good to have you with us if you're a first time visitor special welcome to you we're gonna worship some more okay if you can let's stand back up as we continue to sing together great the chasm that lay between us 
How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who saved me.
that I don't understand. Some things I can't come to grip with. Sometimes I just look out in the world and think, why? Why me, God? Why this situation? Why them, Lord? Why this tribulation? down on my luck for a while. I mean, I don't even have an ace in the deck. Just empty hands with no patience that's left. I'm lost in the desert, no oasis. I guess I'm hung out to dry. Lips chapped, feet hurt in this weather. I thirst and I march on, hoping to find an answer. Just an inkling of faith in this world full of cancer would be a refreshing drip of water on the tip of my tongue. The fresh, cool breeze of Jehovah's lungs is exactly what I need. But that feels so far away. I mean, God, are you really with me? Do you really care? When I cry in distress, are you really there? Your word says yes, but sometimes I doubt it. But clearly my own path needs rerouting. Because every time I walk my own way, I get lost, and even though I'm lost in the desert, I now realize He created it. He knows where the water is. He made the sun. His creation is marvelous, and He is in control even when I fail. He is faithful even when I fall. He is what I need even when I doubt. He is fresh water in the midst of the drought. He is God and He is King. He is Lord and gives life to all things. He gives and takes away and sometimes I just need to trust that He knows exactly what He is doing. When I am asleep, He is moving. When I fall, He is choosing to pick me back up with outstretched arms. Nothing that anyone does can separate me from His love because He is faithful. Reigns. Communion is especially for those in the desert. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, not all of us are good. Not all of us have it all together. Not all of us are well are rich but we hear your word your call that we who are broken we who are weak we who are sad we who grieve we're welcome at this table at this table you bring life at this table, you bring acceptance. At this table, you bring hope. At this table that your son Jesus set, we become acceptable to you and we become part of your family. We become people that have a purpose. We become people that matter. We become your sons and your daughters. So we come, and we are so grateful. We need you to reign in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there might be more competitive people in this room, but there aren't many of you than me. I, I've always been competitive, and uh, I'll tell you a story that illustrates that. Uh, when I was uh, just in Bible college and then into seminary, my kids were too young to play golf with me, uh, so I'd go play golf around my studies and jobs and stuff. I'd go play golf, and inevitably I get matched up with other people that were uh, by themselves so that we would play together. And so I'd, I'd play with these guys, and, you know, I'd notice how they were playing. 
and uh, particularly uh, when they would hit bad shots. One, one, two guys I remember in particular I was matched up with, when they would hit a bad shot, uh, they would unleash some words that weren't PG, if you know what I'm saying. And they kept playing, and I didn't say anything, and we kept playing. And, and so I waited till the right moment, the 16th green. I waited till the right moment to work into the conversation that I was a preacher. <laughs> and they, you should, I still remember their faces. That's been 30 years ago. They were like, why did you, why did you tell us? Why did you do? We would have we would have talked differently. We would have been using those words. They didn't hit a good shot the rest of the round. <laughs> Kaching, that's right. Kaching. But they had a, and it's it's a more common view of ministry and church than we like to admit. I think what we need to get through our heads is what a lot of people think is true and what should the church should be about and ministry should be about what clergy and laity should be about is all unbiblical (laughs) it's not what God intended we need to understand that God never meant for the people who served him vocationally to wear collars and robes and have titles like reverend and father He didn't mean for there to be a difference between the people who serve him vocationally and all the people who follow him. He sees us all the same. Question that. See, some a a couple people came out of the first service and they were like this, because we just take it for granted. We think church and we pass along what church should be and what the people in church should be, what the pastor, preacher, reverend should be, and, and we, we don't even question it. But the scripture has a different view. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, this is the foundational passage for the whole sermon series that I've been preaching to you. Uh, preaching to you. This talks about us being living stones. It talks about the biblical view of the church, what the church should be, what the people who serve him should be. So we're going to learn together. We're going to ask three questions of this passage together. Three questions of what the biblical church should be. What you and I should be as part of his church. The first question maybe is a strange place for you to start, but the first question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Another place in the New Testament says, the church is the body of Christ. Now, first, you need to understand there's a big C church, the the universal church, and then there are little C congregations of that big C church. We're a little C congregation here at Northside of the big C church. We are part of the body of Christ. But Jesus has a role in that. If he is the head of the body, then we need to understand who he is. To God, he is the chosen stone. To God, he is the chosen stone. Verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. Chosen and precious are important words in this passage. Note how many times you see them. He is chosen and precious, but first you see him called the living stone. What an odd term. Now, Peter himself was his Hellenic name meant rock. The word for rock in Greek, the language of the New Testament, is petros. But that's not the word here. <clears throat> the word here is lithos. A rock is something that you find in the earth, something that has an irregular shape. A stone, on the other hand, a lithos, is something that has been pulled out of the ground. It's been shaped to fit into a structure. It is a building block. A stone mason has chipped it in and made it fit into a wall or into a part of a building to build up something. And so he's saying, Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is uh, the, the coming foundational piece of a different way for God to interact with his people. The Bible says the church is the new Israel. And Jesus' coming initiated the church age. 
the messianic age, if you will. To God, he is the chosen stone. It wasn't an accident. It always was to be that he would come and be his chosen stone. He says in verse 6, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. He came to eradicate guilt and shame. I think many, many, many of us have an esteem problem. <clears throat> Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves based on worldly characteristics, but most of the time we have a low esteem problem. Life has a way of beating us down. People reject us. We perhaps get fired from a job. We perhaps get broken up with by someone. Someone divorces us. We have a way of getting our esteem we have a way of getting to a place where we don't feel valued or we don't feel precious. We don't feel special. We don't feel we have purpose. We know shame. We know guilt. This word says that Jesus is the God's chosen stone and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame, which leads me to say this. To believers, he is the precious living cornerstone. Now, architecturally, if you're building a building out of stone, you had to have a foundational piece. The first piece, the cornerstone had to be set. That cornerstone had to be level, it had to be firm, it had to be set in place because the whole building depended on that cornerstone. If the cornerstone was off, the building had no chance. The Jesus becomes to those who believe. And notice, it is not by what you do, it's not by your works that you're seen as acceptable, able to be saved by God. It is by your faith, your belief. To believers, he is the precious living cornerstone. Again with verse 6, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, you who have faith, this stone is precious. Maybe you can remember back, like I can, to a time where Jesus wasn't precious to me. At best, I ignored him. At best, people ignore him. They don't accept him. But when you come to Jesus, he, he becomes precious to you. He becomes a living foundation. He becomes the foundation that you can count on. Your values you place in the values you seek to follow Jesus, you seek to live like Jesus, then he becomes living in you. He becomes your foundation, your touch point, your cornerstone. But to the world, he's the stumbling stone. Or maybe today here, you're on the fence. Maybe you're searching. You haven't quite committed to Jesus. Right now, he's not your precious living cornerstone. Maybe you need to hear that to those who don't believe, and that's what the world means, to those who don't believe, he is the stumbling stone. He, he becomes the, the foundational decision between right or wrong, between sheep or goat, between those who have heaven in their future and those who don't. What does he say? But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. They don't accept the gospel. They don't accept Jesus Christ. They don't confess and repent of their sins. They don't accept it, which is also what they were destined for. God knew in advance the people that would accept him and those who wouldn't. He knew in advance. He wants all people to be saved. It says that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believed in him might not perish but have everlasting life. He wants everyone to be saved, but he knows in advance that some will say no. Some will reject him. And for them, they become not the stone that leads to life that life is built upon, they become, the stone becomes a crushing stone. And they move away from God rather than toward him. None of us want to be there. If you're on the fence, if you have questions, I want you to talk to me. 
Talk to me after the service. Email me, call me this week. We can talk through it. But it starts with this decision. To God, he's the chosen stone. As you become a believer, he's the precious living cornerstone. But until you accept him, uh, and as long as you're part of the world, he is rejected and he is a stumbling stone for you. All that leads me then to this. Who are we who believe? Who are we who believe? We see who Jesus is, according to Peter. Who are we who believe? He first says in verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Now listen, you also like living stones. That's the first idea. That's the first identity that you want to see here. That each, we each become living stones. Almost sounds weird to, to think of stones that are living. But, but what you might understand, maybe it makes more sense to you. We become building blocks. Building blocks, you're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So there are two identities you want to hear today. As you come to Christ, as you believe in him, you become a living stone. You become a priest, a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a priest. Welcome to the priesthood. You see, you... Perhaps have thought about people like me as the priest, but no. When you accept Christ, you become a priest. More about that in a minute. Look at verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. There it is again, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, once you were lost, once you were depressed, once you were unsure of who you were and what you could be, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So let's dig into those two, those two identities. You're a living stone. What that means then is this is Northside Christian Quarry instead of a church. That we are in the stone-making business the living stone we are shaping the lives that come here to be a living active dynamic part of the body that is growing and building and bringing more stones into us uh, it's a mind-blowing conception isn't it you start thinking like that it changes the view that you have of all that we do here every bible class if we think like this every bible class would be a quarry for living stones as we gather together in community groups or bible studies we are forming and shaping the building blocks of the next generation of God's family. We're becoming the living body that's building up so we can build out. Every worship service would be a time of suspense as we wait to see what God is doing to add more living stones to his temple. Every missionary we send out would be a stonemason sent to the ends of the earth in search of living stones for God's temple. It changes everything to start thinking about each one of us as a building block for the living, active church of God that's going to change the world. Next, he calls us priests. We maybe don't understand the context of priests. You look at priests in the Old Testament, you see this. He called a certain group of men. In fact, one of the 12 tribes was called the Levites. The Levites were the priestly tribe. They were to serve him as priests. They had special privileges and special responsibilities. They had many duties, but you could sum them up by saying they offered sacrifices before the Lord. When the people brought an animal to be sacrificed, the priest would slit its throat, drain the blood, and offer the carcass on the altar of sacrifice. There was one man called the high priest who offered the most important sacrifice of all. On the Day of Atonement each year, he, only on the Day of Atonement, he would take the blood of a goat and go behind the thick veil into the Holy of Holies where he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant. That signified that the sins of the people had been atoned or covered by that blood of the sacrifice. 
but only he could offer that sacrifice. And only on one day each year. It was one man, one sacrifice, and only once a year. The whole Old Testament system sent a message that it wasn't easy to approach God. The ordinary Israelite could not offer his own sacrifices. He had to go through the priest who offered his sacrifice for him. The priest served as a go-between to bridge the gap between God and man. That's the Old Testament background, but the New Testament church just took it up and ran with it. For 1,500 years of church history, everybody thought that they had to have a priest, a priest read the Bible for them. They couldn't read it themselves. They thought that they could not confess their sins directly to God. They had to confess to a sin to confess their sins for them. They couldn't bless the elements of the Lord's Supper themselves. They had to have a priest do it. They thought that there was this distinction between the holy priest class and the rest of the people. But that is not the New Testament. First Peter had already been written. That is not the New Testament understanding. We all are holy priests. We all are royal priests. In the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. In the New Testament, we are a priesthood. You are a priest. So what does that mean? How then are we to live? You also, like living stones, look what he says here. Verse 5 is crucial. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And how then are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Every day is a day... To live offering sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices to God. That's what he says. Verse 9, but you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the job of the priesthood, the job of the, the spiritual house of God being built by the living stones is to call people out of the darkness, out from the world, the self-centered, materialistic, nasty, dog-eat-dog world into the marvelous light of being the people of God. That's what the priests do. Let me say it this way. We offer sacrifices first of our bodies. If we're going to be priests, we offer sacrifices of our bodies. And I want you to notice in each one of these scriptures I give you the priestly language. It, it, this is throughout the Bible. It tells us, it reaffirms that we are not a clergy laity church. We are all, we are all priests in the church. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Sometimes we think what we do up here when we sing, that's worship. And it is worship, but your worship happens every day. It happens with the things you put into your body. It happens with the things you do with your body. The choices that you make. The words that you say. We offer spiritual sacrifices or not. It's a priestly expression of our faith the things that we do with our bodies we offer sacrifices of our praise our good works our generosity this is from hebrews chapter 13 through jesus therefore let us continually offer to god a sacrifice of praise that fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with what for with such sacrifices God is pleased. It's priestly language. He and all of the passages in the New Testament, they agree that all of us are priests, all of us to be involved in living a life of sacrificial worship, of devotion to God, to Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. We emulate him. We live as he does. We seek to please him in offering our sacrifices, our worship to God. We offer sacrifices of our witness. To be a minister, this is Romans 15, 16, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty. <coughs> Every priest had the, the, 
the responsibility to represent God, to re represent Christ, to represent his message, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We offer sacrifices of our love. Ephesians chapter 5, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as what? As a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We follow Jesus in putting others before ourselves. We follow Jesus in living our life in love. It's why we talk about generosity so much here, because the degree of our faith leads directly to the degree of our generosity, the degree of our love, of seeing others as important, loving others as ourself. That's what Jesus did. That's what he calls us to do as his priest. And then uh, prayers. We offer sacrifice of our prayers. It's from Revelation. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. You see the language. It's consistent. It's priestly language. So I appreciate the many positive comments this week about uh, the daily devotion I'm doing now, Truths That Transform. You don't know about this every morning at 6, except for Sunday morning, uh, we release a daily devotional that I shoot. Somebody actually asked me, do you get up at 6 and do those? Listen, that, it would be entertaining, but it would make no sense if I did. I'm not a morning person. It would make no sense if I did it at 6 in the morning. But you can get it on our Facebook, Northside Facebook page. There's a daily devotional to help you be in the Word, help you to, to learn my some thoughts, my guided uh, thoughts on understanding and applying the verses that are there. Appreciate that. We also have just now made it available on the app. If you have our app, you go to media, you go to daily devotions, and you can uh, watch it in your phone or uh, with the app. Now, I will tell you, maybe you'll have the same problem I did. I had the old version of the app. I had to delete that and download the new version to be able to watch it directly in my phone. But I tell you all that to say this. I was shooting one of the videos this week and, and serendipity happened. You know what serendipity is? Serendipity is when uh, you're doing something or you're somewhere and, and completely out of the blue, something mind blowing, something crazy happens. That it might seem coincidence, but, but it is serendipitous. It, this comes and just hits you up side the head it's like it's like amazing revelation and so I was shooting that I was talking about light and darkness you know here we talked about light and darkness and I want to tell you all around you is darkness some of your family's in the dark I talked about be, people being lost and hopeless feeling like they had no value and purpose that's some of us who are here it's many who are out in the dark all around you at the workplace there are people in the dark there are people in your school that are in the dark and this talked about Jesus came to bring light into the darkness we just saw that we're supposed to come out of the darkness in the praises of his wonderful light and so I was talking about that I started the devotion by having the lights off and then at the end of the devotion I prayed and turned the lights off and this is what you could see now I'm in that shot anybody see me I look good don't I you can't see me all you can see and I didn't plan it this way all you can see is I had a sweatshirt on, a sweatshirt on that said NCC Northside Christian Church in the midst of the darkness all you could see was the church. That's what God meant the church to be. And each of us, we are the church. 
That's what he meant for you to be. And all the people that are around you in the dark, he meant for them to be able to see because you live lives of priestly sacrifice. You live lives of priestly service. All around, he meant for those people in the dark that you love, your family and your friends and your classmates and your co-workers. He meant for all of them when everything was going to pot, everything was messed up, he wanted them to be able to see that God cares, that God has people who follow the light and are living for the light, who are serving the light. He meant for people to see the church. The church is all of you. You're a priest. You are a priest. You're a living stone, a building block for the most dynamic, most powerful organization that has ever existed on earth. It continues to live, even though communist organizations try to stamp it out, even though totalitarian regimes try to get rid of it, even though people try to legislate the church out of America. Listen, it is not dying. It is on the move. It is living and active. It is the building blocks of God's kingdom. It is the priests of God that step up and stand up and will live and be the light for those in the dark. And we will not stop. We will not quit. Be a part of us. Father, we pray today that we see the church not in the messed up ways that church history reveals to us that people have lived. We see it not as a place of clergy and laity, reverends and titles and ornate buildings. The church is each one of us as living stones and priests. Help us, help us to be faithful. Help us to be the light. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. It's ministry time, if you wanna become a Christian, we can help you with that. We're gonna join us here formally, become a formal member of Northside, we can help you with that. But I thank you here today, all of us, <laughs> all of us, all of us are priests. Let's stand and sing. If you have a decision, please come. Amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so
Lord, this life brings suffering. Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. Yeah. We sing, God, you're so good. Because God, you're so good. God, you're so good. 